I'm Michael Geist. I'm a law professor at the University of Ottawa, and I think uniquely for the various panels that, that are taking place here over the next couple of days, um, there's no data protection commissioner or privacy commissioner on this panel. I'm serving as both chair and moderator. Um, so with great power, I guess, comes great responsibility, um, holding both of those big roles. Um, anyhow, I'm going to uh, try to shepherd us through what I think will be a really interesting discussion on uh, issues that have certainly been discussed for, for quite some time. I mean, the notion of trying to find the appropriate balance between both the privacy considerations on the one side and intellectual property rights on the other, uh, particularly in an enforcement, when it comes to copyright enforcement, isn't particularly new. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's fair to say that over the last number of years, it's an issue that has grown in increasing prominence. Uh, and I think that's true for, for a number of reasons. Certainly part of it is the legislative activity that we've seen in, in some countries, particularly the emergence of three strikes proposals, or in some countries actually three strikes being implemented in a number of jurisdictions. And over the last, actually just week or two, we've started to see some reports in some jurisdictions that have adopted three strikes about initially what's, what's taking place, uh, including in France, where Hadopi um, apparently is receiving about 25,000 notifications a day uh, and in South Korea, there have been also thousands of notifications and a number of people who have uh, had their access to the internet disconnected. Uh, so when it comes to an issue like three strikes, we've moved beyond, in a sense, the theoretical to talk a bit about the prospects of some of these policies uh, into ac seeing these actually implemented. At an international level, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, ACTA, attracted a, a significant amount of attention over the last number of years, over the last year or two, and it was uh, privacy elements that played a, a pretty significant role uh, there as well. There's, of course, the individual lawsuits that we see from time to time, and not time to time, we've seen, seen fairly frequently. Uh, and then the technologies that, um, that, that are all variants, many of them are variations on some of the digital rights management types of technologies that, that purport to provide new levels of control, but Certainly many have, have and, and perhaps do provide new levels of control, but at the same time have raised, I think, some significant privacy considerations. Um, and at the same time, complicating many of these matters further, and I'm hoping we have the opportunity to, to get into this a little bit, um, is that it's often presented as sort of the, the rights holders seeking to enforce their rights on the other, and then intermediaries often finding themselves sitting in the middle. Um, the users, uh, who of course, whose personal information uh, is at play here in many respects, often have a difficult time coming forward at all, uh, because to come forward is effectively to reveal your identity, which is in many instances precisely what happens to be at stake. Uh, so it's a, it's a complicated matrix that I think often arises, and I think we, we've got a, a terrific panel to try to address some of these, some of these issues, and so we're, we'll spend the next 90 minutes or so hopefully engaging in a real dialogue. Uh, we're starting out with, with no formatted PowerPoints or, or those kinds of presentations. I'm going to ask each panelist to provide us with about five minutes um, with their perspective, and, and they've been given the latitude to touch on any of the kinds of considerations that they think are, are most relevant. And then I'm hoping that we can drill down on some of those issues, get into some, other, some considerations that perhaps given that we don't have a data protection commissioner on our panel, we might want to engage in a little bit, uh, we can prescribe what their job description perhaps ought to be uh, on some of these issues, given that they're not even here to defend themselves on this panel, we could talk a bit about what role we think the regulator should or ought to play uh, as part of this. And we've got, a we've got a panel that represents a wide range of perspectives, ranging from movie industry, internet service providers, uh, civil society, academics. It really, uh, I think, covers the gamut, so we're in for a treat. So I'm going to start with... Uh, Ted Shapiro, who's with the Motion Picture Association, ask each panelist to introduce themselves briefly and then away we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Michael said, my name is Ted Shapiro. I work for the Motion Picture Association in Brussels, which is a trade association that represents major international producers and distributors of uh, audiovisual works. Uh, I'm the general counsel for Europe and my focus is on content protection. My colleague, Laurence Jolacquien, who uh, was meant to be on the panel, couldn't come at the last minute due to doctor's orders, so I'm gonna do my best to um, fill in. Uh, I mostly come at this from a copyright lawyer's point of view. I've had to learn uh, privacy law over the last years, um, and 
I already take issue with the notion that it's necessarily IP versus uh, DP. Uh, we think that these two fundamental rights can easily be reconciled and the courts are doing it on a daily basis. Indeed, there are a lot of parallels between uh, privacy and copyright protection. As I said, both are fundamental rights uh, recognized at, at the European and international level uh, based on legal principles, both subject to limited exceptions, often to preserve public interest objectives uh, that are applied under specific and limited conditions. Um, both uh, may be protected in certain cases by technological measures. Uh, and the main purpose uh, is, of course, respect of, for the law and ethical behavior. And as we learned this morning from one of the speakers in the plenary, both can serve to uh, encourage... Uh, can, can serve to encourage innovation and both have a role to do with building trust on the internet. Both would benefit from a little bit more legal certainty, but there shouldn't be any conflicts. Uh, and indeed, it's very interesting, at least in Europe, to see the way court cases have dealt with this, both at the European uh, level, as well as in the member states. Uh, and usually it's about a balancing act. Uh, these decisions demonstrate that a proportionality test needs to be applied um, and they also show a certain pragmatism of the courts. For those of you that have not read it, I commend to you the uh, Pro Musicae case uh, as well as um, uh, the Linquitz case, uh, KU versus Finland, and a wide range of other cases at the national level. Um, and rather than just these decisions themselves, what is interesting is the reasoning. Um, these are complex issues that courts have to struggle with, uh, and they need to look at it often on a case-by-case -case basis. Solutions do need to be found. It's a shame that no data protection uh, commissioners are, are on the panel, because a lot more discussion will be needed. Now, from the point of view of the MPA, we are not interested, except for on very, very rare cases, in the revelation of the personal details of individual end users. Uh, as uh, my focus on content protection in Europe is 100%, is 99% focused on going after large scale sites that are facilitating and in some cases directly infringing copyright on a massive scale. I'm talking about things like Pirate Bay, Mininova, and other sites like that. Um, we do need to sometimes find out who's operating these sites and we will go to court and ask the court um, to compel, for example, the hosting provider to provide those details. Uh, it's interesting that these sites that we focus on uh, don't give a damn about anybody's privacy. Uh, and they, as a matter of fact, part of their business model is collecting people's data. Um, of course, they're not responsible and these issues of secondary liability are, are very difficult for the courts to struggle with. In the EU, we have very good copyright legislation and we have very good data protection legislation. Both of these uh, pieces of legislation, the Copyright Directive and the Data Protection Framework Directive and the E-Privacy Directive, of course, have to then be implemented by the member states. And we see a lot of differences there due to differing implementations. We generally regret that we don't have better cooperation with ISPs and sometimes we have difficulty building cases uh, because of strict interpretation of data protection um, rules. Uh, and so, looking forward, we are looking for a lot more dialogue with data protection authorities. Uh, there's going to be an interesting discussion and review of the 1995 uh, Framework Privacy Directive. Um, and so, uh, really interested and open to the discussion. Um, uh, with respect to ACTA, it's a bit of a red herring. Uh, there was never any three strikes test, uh, three strikes as you uh, euphemistically call it, or it's often referred to as the graduated response. That's not in ACTA, never was going to be. There's no impact on liability rules. And in fact, the current version of the text is very clear on the relationship of that instrument to privacy rules. Uh, in fact, I think privacy is mentioned six times in the current version of the ACTA um, text that was recently uh, distributed. The Hadopi law in France was carefully constructed 
to be in compliance with French data protection rules, and finally received approval from the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL. Um, and these graduated responses, which again are not our main focus, are really about education uh, and not strict enforcement. Our focus, as I said at the beginning, is on large-scale sites that are making a lot of money off of providing access and uh, making available infringing content. And with that, I'll turn over to my next colleague. Great, thanks. Okay, I think there's, there's a, a lot there that we can, we can delve into a little later. Uh, but first, uh, Katitsa, who's coming from EFF, will provide a bit of a privacy perspective. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, yes, I came from, I'm a pro privacy lawyer, not a copyright lawyer. So I came from other perspective. Um, so in EFF, we believe that the internet is an engine of expression, representing an extraordinary advance in the ability of information and opinion. The internet has been given voice to millions of people who can now share their ideas and thoughts using different mechanisms, it's with your name, your pseudonym, or a nickname. It makes enable new avenues for creativity, collaboration, bring justice and transform communities in varying degrees and for civic discourse. Policies reducing the cost and barriers for user-generated content made it flourish. That's why I the internet intermediary liability is the key policy issue affecting both internet users' privacy and freedom of expression rights and the future of the free and open internet. Although limitations of liability and legal regimes were adopted in many countries around the world uh, around 2002, these are now under a great de deal of pressure. Uh, through litigation, proposed leg legislative reform, and voluntary agreements between copyright holders and internet intermediaries. Limitations of liability are necessary, not just for fostering investment and innovation, but also for fostering, protecting citizens' freedom and expression, and expression of privacy rights. Internet intermediaries are usually the weakest link in the change of communication, and the legal frameworks in many countries encourage internet intermediaries to take content down and disconnect their customer, customers' internet access rather than spend any resources to investigate the validity of a claim. Copyright owners and others reach out to the weak link, the service provider, with the least incentive to resist taking down whatever content is being challenged. And let's Unless the service provider has a pro bono lawyer, the cost of doing an analysis and of defending a lawsuit, even if the service provider knows it will win, it's almost certainly more than a service provided in charging any individual customer. That's in okay, thank you. <laughs> Thus, internet intermediaries are a prime target in countries where laws incentive internet intermediaries to take down contact or take other actions without actual proof of wrongdoing. In the context of enforcing copyright law, efforts to increase internet intermediary liability are being driven by copyright holders or intellectual, pro uh, intellectual, intellectual property right holders. As we see, copyright owners are seeking internet intermediaries to police copyright infringement that cause collateral damage to citizens' fundamental privacy and freedom of expression rights. Internet, intermediary, internet intermediaries' responsibility to protect copyright risk creates an unbalanced regime that will harm other equally important public policy objectives of protecting citizens' personal data, privacy, and freedom of expression. Among those examples we have, for instance, copyright owners were seeking obligations on internet intermediaries to engage in network level filtering of internet communications for potential copyright infringement materials. Uh, right holders sought this in the Belgian Savant um, versus Scarlet case and the Irish Music Association versus Ergon case, and in their submission to the US negotiations of the anti trade anti, anti counterfeiting trade agreement, ACTA. For us, level ne level fil uh, network level filtering is ineffective because it can be defeated by other technologies, for instance, in encryption. A user who wants to share copyright content will simply move to a file sharing program that has encrypt transfers that will render the filters useless. But it's dangerous because it requires intermediaries to engage in the packet inspection but at an ubiquitous surveillance of all internet users' communications. Contrary to the millennium consensus in the US and the EU, 
law that internet intermediaries who act as a mere conducts are not obliged to monitor their customers' communication to benefit from the safe harbor. This directly threatens data protection rights and privacy rights. That's we will continue later in okay. other examples. All right. that, that provides with a good start on some of the, the privacy considerations that, that come up as well as some of the expression issues as well when it comes to, to filtering and the like. Um, next we have Elisa Bergman, who's the Chief Privacy Officer and Vice President with Warner Brothers. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate on this panel. I'm delighted to be here in Jerusalem. And um, Ted has taken all of the good ideas that I was going to say, but I'll reiterate some of them because they're so good, they're, they're worth repeating, actually. Um, I thought before I started, I would um, offer an analogy um, that I hope will be helpful in uh, thinking about these issues. And it really builds on some of the topics that were discussed this morning in the public versus private. And um, I'd like to suggest that there seems to be a difference between watching a movie at home or downloading a movie at home and oh, I have a visual. I, it's always helpful to, to see something and since I've got some hot property here. Uh, watching a movie at home or downloading a movie at home and if I was to stand in the streets of Jerusalem and distributed these pirated uh, materials. So think about it, that as I give my opening remarks and repeat some of the things that Ted said in a different way and um, also as we have our discussions because I think it would be interesting to talk about uh, that dichotomy in, in this uh, forum. Um, as Ted said, the title of our panel is uh, Intellectual Property versus Data Protection and we don't think it's a zero-sum game. We think that's a false dichotomy. In fact, we think the two can coexist quite well and that there should be strong protections for both of them. And in fact, also, I'd like to continue with the, the title of the, the policy, which is uh, the panel, which is uh, in enforcement. And um, we think that uh, protecting privacy and copyright both require similar multi-prong um, approaches. And in fact, we need to look at the uh, entirety of the, of the solution. Um, sometimes in the privacy world, we call it the three-legged stool or the four-legged stool in terms of the uh, approach to protection. I guess it depends on how wobbly you want to be that day. But today, I'll, I'll talk about a four-legged stool in terms of content protection. And um, uh, we look at uh, protecting content fr from these four perspectives. First, we look at embracing new business models legitimate consumer choice for content, giving consumers what they want, when they want it, where they want it, uh, and embracing these new uh, emerging platforms and things like that, that enables us to uh, prevent some of the piracy um, that is out there. Second, as Ted said, uh, there's technological protection measures uh, that we're working with and digital rights management. And a lot of those approaches to protecting IP don't implicate privacy. For example, uh, the use of encryption, secure output, uh, secure personal networks, and playback and copy control watermarks. Uh, in addition, under the, the leg of the stool that's technological protection measures, we're really building in uh, topics that will be very familiar to those of you in the privacy community, uh, privacy impact assessments, and really thinking about privacy by design in, in using these uh, technological protection measures. And the third leg of the stool would be education and awareness. There we're working on public service announcements and copyright awareness educational campaigns. And um, uh, something that Michael called three strikes you're out, but as Ted said, we uh, more lovingly refer to it as graduated response. And we actually put that in the education bucket, as, as Ted said. A lot of times uh, we hear about that in the enforcement context, but um, we're really thinking of that as a, an educational tool to educate subscribers about um, the nature of um, their activity and encouraging them to, to stop uh, illegal downloading. And then finally, we have the enforcement uh, leg of the stool. And as Ted said, really, that's uh, where there's the points of interplay between privacy and um, uh, intellectual property. We think that the key words are balance and proportionality. Uh, one thing I would say is that um, not all digital activities should be regarded as equal. And so now I come back to the display that we had before, whereas downloading from a website is quite different than making a file available uh, to share uh, in a P2P software situation. Um, as I said, it's the same thing as watching a movie in the home is really quite different than me distributing pirated uh, goods out on the street. And I think that's a, a point worth discussing further particularly as these uh, debates proceed and given some of the things we've heard this morning from both the Peters who were on the, the earlier panel. Um, and I, I would be remiss in building on what Ted said if we don't talk about our friend, the IP address as personal data. Um, as Ted said also, different regimes have come to different conclusions, and I'm sure there'll continue to be much debate about whether an IP address is personal data. Um, but even if it is considered personal data, we think that that's really not the end of the inquiry. We need to look at what activity is connected to the address, and again, whether it's public versus private activity, and we can talk about different spheres of public versus private, and is that changing in the current 
different context given some of the, the new things that are available and is there different regimes uh, of public and actually how that's interpreted maybe in the US versus um, in Europe. And um, also that you shouldn't be able to hide behind the IP address as a shield for a legal activity. And just finally, there's lots of concepts that are sort of cardinal bedrock principles in the privacy world that we really think should be um, applied and, and thought about in this context, which is just as the respect for the privacy rights in the digital environment are essential to creating digital trust, so too is respect for intellectual property rights. Consumers really deserve to know that the works and goods that they are obtaining um, are genuine. The same way you'd want to make sure that the medicines that you get are, there's no problems with, the, with those. You'd want to make sure that the movie files that you're downloading aren't bringing viruses or, or other types of malware into the, the network. And, um, and since we're all thought leaders here on privacy, there's a lot of, that's been discussed about how information communication and digital technology should be developed to incorporate privacy by design. And we are thinking about um, suggesting that the concept be expanded to one of integrity by design, where not only privacy rights, but also intellectual property rights be addressed. So in the same way that information and communication technologies um, are designed and developed in a way that respect privacy and data protection, so too should they be designed and developed in a way that respect IP rights. So we think that the goal is the same, to create a digital environment based on trust, respect for the law, and consumer protection and safety. So as I said, many, many, much of what I said was, uh, builds upon what Ted said, and we hope that that gives a, a good flavor for discussion as well. Okay, it does, and uh, obviously we've got a few of the points where um, we could see, I think, an opportunity for, for some further discussion and exploration. Um, let's get, we've had a couple of different perspectives now. How about the Internet Service Provider side with Robert Quinn? Um, yeah, so I'm, my name is Bob Quinn, and I'm uh, uh, not only uh, AT&T's new Chief Privacy Officer, I took over for Dorothy Atwood, who left us to go to Disney last month. Um, better? Good. Uh, but I, I also uh, uh, had AT&T's FCC group um, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and, you know, we believe um, that the content owners um, do have a point. Um, there is an issue out there with, with uh, piracy uh, and violation of copyright laws. And we have worked with the content owners um, over the course of the last several years um, to do things that I think would fall into the bucket of graduated response but nothing like the three strikes and you're out um, uh, proposals uh, that I've, I've read about and, and I think that Michael has referred to. Our, our way of approaching this um, is to work with various content companies to provide notices to consumers. Basically, um, uh, some of the content companies uh, that have participated in several of the trials with us um, will give us the IP addresses of uh, people who they suspect the violations, we will provide a notice to the consumers um, that will advise them of the issue and basically just say, you, look, you've been identified by a content owner. Uh, and, and I think through that process, we are trying to raise consumer awareness and educate consumers. I think that that process has worked um, very, very well. Uh, in terms of making people understand if they're running wireless routers in their house, how to encrypt the routers, uh, if, if, if that is the source of, of copyright. Um, it educates you know, a lot of parents uh, or, or perhaps uh, some members of the household who aren't aware of what some of the other members of the household are, are doing on their internet connection. Uh, we try to point out that, uh, that illegal downloading of content um, is unlawful. It's a violation of our terms of service. But where we have drawn the line and where we continue to draw the line is, is we, can't, we don't want, as an ISP, to be put in the position of enforcing the copyright laws. Um, we will help to educate the consumer, but at the end of the day, it's really up to the governments to enforce the copyright laws um, and, and, and so we, we just, no solution that requires us to terminate our customer or to put our customer on the blacklist simply based on an allegation from a private copyright owner, um, is, it's just not workable from our perspective. Um, ultimately, governments are, are responsible for enforcement. Um, we believe that the enforcement mechanisms out there, as particularly in the United States, have to be improved. Um, and we're willing to participate 
in the process to get that improvement. Um, but I, I think customer education has gone a long way, at least from our perspective, to help curb this problem. And I think at the end of the day, we're going to need a solution that involves the government, it's going to involve the copyright owners, it's going to involve the ISPs, and we're going to have to come up with a cooperative way to improve the situation because it is a problem. Um, piracy continues to be a problem for the copyright holders, and we've got to come up with better solutions than we currently have. That's it. Fair enough. I mean, I, it's interesting. No, and, and I think we'll get into it in a few minutes. The you know, the the notion that notices serve an educational function, I think, is absolutely true. In fact, Canada's had the same sort of system. The issue is once you start getting further, um, where you start implicating some of the expression issues we heard about, some of the privacy issues that we heard about, and that's when we start have, have to, I think, grapple with whether or not these are totally consistent, or whether or not there is some some element of conflict. Um, certainly, last but not least, Julie Cohen from the Georgetown uh, Law Center, who's, who's well known for having focused both on privacy and uh, copyright and intellectual property issues. Julie. Okay. Thank you. And first, I'd like to extend my thanks um, to our Israeli hosts for a lovely and well-run conference. It's a delight to be here. Um, I think it's revealing that there are no data privacy commissioners on this panel. Um, if, you're, if you've been paying attention, you now know how important the clash between data protection and intellectual property is. Um, it's uh, front and center within U.S. debates about information law and policy. Um, uh, and in Europe, um, as I see it, the two principal gaping holes in the Data Protection Directive are the um, Data Retention Directive and the, um, the question of intellectual property enforcement. Um, and, and it's uh, a difficult and controversial issue that the Data Protection Commissioners, um, in my view, uh, haven't um, thought much about how to deal with. And so um, it would be nice if next year, when there is a panel about this, they were on the panel. But since they're not here, um, we can proceed ahead. Um, I, I, um, I had in my notes um, that the content-owning industries um, will argue that DP versus IP is a false dichotomy. Um, and, uh, and they did. Um, and um, it's um, often in U.S. debates about this, at least, um, uh, if you dig a little further, um, and certainly in the court opinions where courts have addressed uh, when to disclose sub subscriber data, um, courts are fond of expressing the opinion that if you are infringing, you have no privacy um, in interests in the, in, in the uh, infringing material. Um, and then advocates for user privacy are want to respond, as Katitsa did, that um, when you put IP first over DP, you produce chilling effects on lawful activities like freedom of expression uh, and public discourse. And I think that that's absolutely right, but I think that argument actually concedes too much, um, both about the scope of the privacy interest and about what else is at stake in this debate about uh, IP versus DP. Uh, I, I agree, in fact, DP versus IP is a false dichotomy, um, but it's false because I would say that individuals have a presumptive privacy interest in their online activities, even if they are infringing. That's what privacy means. Um, and I think uh, to argue to the contrary uh, is disingenuous. Um, there's, a, there's a belief um, that we have, because we are uh, living in the digital age, in the possibility of perfect enforcement, that we could actually get such perfect information and use the information so perfectly as to allow us to make a perfect separation between lawful and unlawful content. Um, it is technocratic, um, it is optimistic, and it is, in my view, wholly unwarranted. The idea that you could accomplish uh, a radical extension of surveillance of intellectual consumption without affecting, uh, in a fundamental way, the structure of the networked information environment, uh, or, and without constraining the communicative freedom of good law-abiding people, is a fantasy. It's false. There is abundant historical evidence um, that, uh, that surveillance of intellectual consumption has radically altering effects uh, in the political environment. Um, and, uh, and sort of enough said uh, about that. I think that the stakes in this controversy also are not limited to protection of personal data, um, but instead concern the architecture of the networked information environment as a whole. 
Um, and in particular, the stakes are about the extent to which the networked information environment affords breathing room for individual behavior, or whether instead it is gradually reconfigured to impose tight mandatory constraints um, involving automated filtering, uh, surveillance of network traffic, uh, graduated response or three strikes, take your pick, it's the same at the end of the day. Um, the gradual insertion of pervasive constraint within the architecture of the network does not only threaten privacy. Um, it turns out, when you dig a little deeper, that diminished architectural tolerance for play and exploration threatens values that are fundamental and not just to privacy, but on both sides of the equation, um, creativity and privacy both. Um, so what is privacy in practice? Um, from a social science perspective, it's the use of selective disclosures to manage your interpersonal boundaries within social contexts. Everything that we know about that process from a social science perspective tells us it's vital for the development of a healthy critical subjectivity. Uh, in other words, that breathing room for individual exploration and play is fundamental for self-development and for continuing development of a thriving civil society. In seeking to implement pervasive constraint within the network, that value is jeopardized. But everything we know on the copyright side about the way creative people work and the ways individuals receive and interact with culture and cultural goods also tells us that pervasive constraint is toxic to creativity. It's toxic to cultural participation. Um, and individual exploration and play with cultural goods is essential for a dynamic and thriving artistic and intellectual culture. Um, when you filter that activity on an automated basis, you may say that what you care about is the pirate, not the individual, but unless the tools are that good, you get them both. Um, and that's a big problem. Uh, and it's a problem, um, as I said, that threatens values that we hold dear at a most fundamental level on both sides of this supposed dichotomy. When people become accustomed to an environment in which the only possible communications are those that are filtered and authorized, we all lose. Um, and there I will stop. Okay. Thanks. Well, I think that, that was great. It certainly helped set things up. I, we've got about almost an hour for discussion now, and I want to emphasize that I'm hoping this is a dialogue not just amongst uh, people up here, but amongst you as well. And so in a minute or two, I'll ask the microphone to start getting distributed, um, and we'll have the opportunity for questions. I saw a hand go up already. Let's do a, a couple of questions here and then try to ensure that we have the opportunity for a lot of discussion. I guess I want to come back and, you know, frankly, I didn't mean to use a three strikes as a loaded term. I'm quite happy to call it graduate response. It doesn't really matter to me very much what we call it. Uh, what matters to me far more, I think, are the, the consequences and the privacy implications of it. And I think we've, I think we've highlighted a couple, that, or at least a couple, have, have come out as part of this. One is the, the mechanisms that are needed to allow something like uh, graduate response or three strikes to occur, which is the, ne the necessity for some level of surveillance to identify what users are doing on the network. And I think we had a case out of Switzerland uh, just in the last number of weeks that focused specifically on that aspect of it. And so that clearly raises some privacy issues, whether or not that's uh, a contest one or the other uh, or in conflict. It's one that, that we've got to to sort through. Uh, and then the, the other part of, of the equation that comes up, and this comes up not just in that particular model, but in almost any model where we're ultimately dealing with end user information. I'll, I'll, I'll park the, the issue of the pirate bays to the side, because I don't think anybody's all that focused on any privacy, on the privacy implications of going after the pirate bay. There may indeed be privacy concerns about what pirate bay or sites like that are doing, uh, but that's not really where the concerns in this context arise. The concerns in this context arise where there are instances where the individual's information is required or asked to be disclosed by an intermediary, say, say like you, under what circumstances, if any, are, the, are, are those, is, is that appropriate? And we've heard that perhaps the presumption, not perhaps, the presumption ought to be that, it's, that you, you have a privacy right full stop. Other various countries have tried to, to grapple with that. We heard about a number of the cases. So we've got um, a f essentially an initiative, whether however you characterize it, that's obviously gaining increasing currency and attention in a number of jurisdictions. That leaving aside, I think, what are almost the easy cases of how do you go after the so-called pirate sites, raises some pretty clear. Uh, big privacy concerns, both from a surveillance perspective as well as the perspective of the end user's own privacy once they get implicated, potentially accurately, but also, of course, also potentially inaccurately, and the, the personal consequences to that person from a data processing and from a privacy perspective are, are pretty profound. 
Um, so, I mean, that's some of what I'm hearing. I'd like to open it up to, to the, the panel to, to respond a little bit, talk a bit about this model in particular, and hear uh, whether or not you're concerned with some of those privacy issues or whether or not you think there are, are effective mechanisms for, for addressing them. Okay. Let's start with Ted, if you want. Well, I mean, if you want to focus on the issue of uh, graduated response, uh, which is anything but uh, or far, far from away, away from the Big Brother scenario painted by uh, Professor Cohen. Um, the, in order to identify infringements on the internet, we basically track infringing content. You could see IP addresses by, for example, joining a BitTorrent stream, a uh, BitTorrent swarm. Uh, we don't know who is engaged in those infringements, and as I said before, we don't want to know. We don't ask for disclosure of those details. Now, the ISP does know, and on the basis of information that we send them, uh, as was just mentioned by Robert, they can send a notice to their, um, to their subscribers. Again, we, we're not asking for a revelation of these details uh, for that notice to go. If we want to find out who that person is because it's someone that put the first new Warner Brothers release up online or is doing... Um, is a, a major release group that stole the film out of the cinema, then we'll go to court and get a court order to find out who that person is. And so we have to rebut the presumption that was mentioned before. So I, I don't see a large scale um, privacy uh, issue there. There have been questions posed about whether, at least under European law, when the data, when the ISP matches up the IP address with his subscriber details, whether that's a processing that may or may not be justified under EU data protection law. Um, but again, no details come back to the rights holder. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, that's how it works with us, and we don't disclose to the rights um, owners any of our customer data. I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate our users. I mean, there's a lot of folks out there who don't understand copyright law. I mean, I have teenage kids, right? And and, and, and I've had this discussion with them, but I've had this discussion with them because I knew to have this discussion with them that when they go to sites to download free music or free videos, that, that they're not free and, and that, that there, are, there are copyright laws and that it's a violation of copyright laws to download that content. Um, not all parents have those discussions with their kids because most, <laughs> most parents aren't in this business of that, that we're in. So, um, I, I think it. I, I think there's also a misperception, if you will, and I, I don't know um, if there's a, a, an age uh, difference on this. I think a lot of people think that they're just absolutely anonymous in terms of what they do on the internet, and we know from the technology that's out there that that's simply not true. So from our perspective, you know, the notice to our customer is just a notice to our customer to tell them, look, somebody's identified you. Um, there are laws out there. It is a violation of your terms of service, and it really tries to serve as an education tool. Um, that's not to say it eliminates the problem, uh, but it, it certainly reduces the problem. In our experience, it reduces the problem um, to, a, to a significant degree. I just wanted to add to uh, what was said by Robert, which is th that's been our experience as well, too, and there's a series of steps that we're taking um, uh, with the companies that we work with to make sure that, that there aren't any false positives and um, we're really looking for full infringing copies of our work. It's not as if when we're sending notices or working with the ISPs to get notices that we're really sending notice to somebody who's got a file called Harry Potter that's just a, a book report on Harry Potter that really not, has nothing to do with, with what we're doing. We're talking about r real pirated uh, work. Well, uh, I will do an. I think that IP address is a personal data, uh, and in, in this context specifically, uh, according to EU data protection law, if you are able to identify a person through the IP address, you should be subject to to the to comply with the with the rules, the obligations, and uh, uh, state in in the law. Uh, in this case, you are able to identify a person through the ISP, and so there. It's a match uh, with what the law says. It's true that different courts have uh, resolved different issues, and it's not a settled matter, unfortunately. But that's why I am calling right now data protection authorities who are here to enforce the law in their country. Some of the collection may be legal under your national data protection law. 
Unfortunately, this is not the case in all countries. In some countries, they are no, and it's a, a traditional problem of privacy. It's not only on this discussion that there are no data protection legislation and there are no enforcement. So many cities, in many countries, we have like no protection. So there are no versus because they are actually not uh, legal. Um, also, I think that uh, the the mon massive monitoring on, and collection of IP addresses it's also infringe one of the key principles in the EU direct uh, in, in EU law, which is the proportionality. Uh, I mean, it should be an and this uh, proportionality, and not only on the EU law, it's also on international covenants. One of the uh, limitations text for the international covenant of civil and political rights is that the document should be proportionate. And this means that it should be restricted measures must conform. They must be the least intrusive instrument among those which might achieve the desired result, and they must be proportional to the interest to be protected. For a restriction to be permissible, it's not enough that it serves one of the enumerated legitimate aims. It might be necessary for reaching the legitimate aims. Those measures need to be analyzed, not only in light of the European context, but also in the international com uh, co uh, context, because this is happening in many countries around the world. Finally, I want to make a comment about the comment about encryption and technology and protection measures. In the discussion within the privacy community, we have different opinions on what privacy by design means. And for us, it's minimizing the collect or anonymizing the collection of personal information. And it's not just by encryption. By encryption, you are fulfilling only the security requirement, which is one of the several data protection uh, rules. So in that case, I don't think it's really a private by design. So, um, so I think it's important to be clear, first of all, that actually nobody is talking about Big Brother. Um, this isn't a coordinated plot being deployed by any government. It isn't even a coordinated plot. Um, it is the logical convergence of a number of individually logical strategies um, that are advanced by people with interests, content industries with interests, and intermediaries with interests in not being hauled into court and subjected to massive secondary liability for infringement. Um, the strategies include the ones that Elisa listed, right? Digital rights management, which doesn't need to implicate privacy, as you said, but often does, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, laws that Katitsa mentioned, such as those that create liability for um, intermediaries who do not uh, take down in a responsible fashion. Um, laws that create liability for equipment designers that do not design their equipment in a responsible fashion. Um, laws that create liability for circumventing uh, uh, protections to get access to material in ways that are unauthorized. Um, so it's not a question of Big Brother, it's a question of a structural shift in the way that the information environment is uh, built out and held accountable or not accountable for the way that information flows around in it. Um, it is also not a question of whether um, if no data flows back past the ISP to the content owner, privacy is therefore adequately protected. Um, because whether or not data flows past the ISP to the content owner, the user experiences the effects of being told, hey, you know what, you use content in any way that is not authorized by your licenses, and you're at risk of big trouble including potentially the big trouble of not having access to the internet at all, which is really big trouble. Um, and um, the, there is, you know, there is some alarmist rhetoric at work here too. Um, so, so if 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 we are told that um, don't you know don't copy something that you're not authorized to copy because it can bring you viruses and malware, um, and any site that is not authorized um, has a business model of collecting your data, the implication is that if you stick with what's authorized, you're safe with us. Um, 
And maybe that's so, because um, here we have a chief privacy officer of a content company, which is totally great, right? Um, uh, yes, the major content companies are reputable companies and have chief privacy offers, officers and want to comply with the applicable laws um, for protecting privacy, but how is it to be the case that these lawful authorized models will work? Um, maybe they won't serve you malware, um, but they have to serve you something to keep track of your consumption um, and meter it properly and keep track of whether or not you're doing what is authorized. Um, uh, or maybe not, but then they have to build the technology in a way that perhaps prevents you from doing that. Um, and if, if not, I'd like to hear more about it. Um, and that business model entails collection of user data. It has to. Um, uh, and so we can quibble about um, whether it's the case that the content companies, because they're reputable and subject to, to whatever privacy laws apply, which in the U.S. isn't that much, um, uh, are more responsible at handling their users' data than the so-called pirate sites. Um, but there's a lot of data collection happening on both sides. Um, and, uh, and a question, a big question on both sides, as to whether consumers are being served without their knowledge, um, something that while we might not want to call it malware uh, or a virus, um, has the potential um, to, to, to keep track. Um, so I think, you know, we need to sweep away the big brother rhetoric, I agree, and we need to sweep away the, oh, those bad pirates will serve you viruses and spam rhetoric and really get to the heart of the matter, um, which has to do um, with the structure of the information environment as users experience it and, and what actually will really happen to their data regardless of what side of that divide we're on. Well, I mean, I think we completely agree that there's a proportional response to this. We just don't necessarily agree what the proportional response is. Um, the notion that all of these things that are taking place are going to somehow converge on this inadvertent Big Brother where everything is constantly monitored, everything is constantly metered, um, seems to me to be far-fetched. And given that we view graduated response as such a small component, uh, that is mostly about notice sending and there's arguments in some countries as to whether there should be consequences uh, it's going to lead us to this, 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 this nightmare scenario that you seem to paint uh, is something that I, that I, that I can't, uh, can't agree with um, but I guess that's what the debate is about Okay, fair enough I, I, I want to open it up but I, I do want to continue with one more piece on this on the notification side and it's, it actually in a sense continues on from this notion that there's more to it than just the, the notifications themselves. And uh, we've talked about the, the absence of a data protection commissioner on this panel. There is, I, I think, the best known example of, of a data protection commissioner who has become engaged on this uh, was the European uh, data protection supervisor, Hugh Stinks, uh, on the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, on ACTA. Uh, because Hugh Stinks put forward a 20-page opinion based uh, on his understanding of, of ACTA at the time. It's, it's now a number of months ago and the, the final text admittedly looks somewhat different uh, from what Houston's put forward, but I think some of the issues that he raised uh, are very relevant because much of his concern within that document was actually focused on graduated response or three strikes. And I, I think one of the, the important insights in that document um, was that he highlighted a number of places where those in the data protection privacy world would immediately recognize potential concerns that have nothing to do actually both necessarily with surveillance and so too with passing on a, an individual's IP address. And so there was concern certainly on the wide scale monitoring and uh, false positives and the like. He raised some of that as well as his view of a right to a private life and how that would be implicated. But even more he talks about required potential for required data preservation from a network provider? Does this move us to an environment where once you say it's, it's necessary to ensure we can educate, but we've also got to require internet providers uh, to preserve, uh, to process information in ways that the customer never would have envisioned? Their expectation in terms of some of their personal information from a processing perspective might be limited to billing related uh, inquiries, but clearly this now moves us in, in other directions, particularly where we've got an agency like Hadopi, and longer term data retention policies as well, or requirements as part of these, as, as part of these kinds of systems. So I, I throw that out there to say that it's more than just necessarily, or at least the privacy community, data protection commissioner here, raising more than just concerns around the potential for this to be an issue just about the individual's IP address, or even the surveillance, although both of those were raised in that document, into what might be seen as essentially bread and butter type issues around data protection. Alisa or 
Yeah, uh, I think the data retention issue is very important when the EDPS mentioned that in the report because, uh, well, the EU data retention directive does not apply for, for uh, it's only applied for serious crime and it's not applied for other kind of crimes. We are talking about terrorism, so very serious crimes. Um, so really the data protection principles apply for the collection of IP address in these cases, which means that they have to be the minimum necessary for the purpose of the business. Um, the EDPS give four weeks for retention. So it's a, like in this case, in this context and in this opinion. So I think that the data should be deleted after that period of time. In general, we are against data retention, not only for these cases, but in general, because communications are communications. And the mere issue that uh, internet traffic leave more detailed traces about your online life should not mean that you have less protection vis-a-vis -vis the government, for instance. So in this case, we are working also EFF to repeal the data retention directive as a whole now that the EU, direct, uh, EU commission is working on the in the implementation. But uh, the, direct, the data retention doesn't apply here, but we hope that the ISPs in other countries where there are no data protection legislation are also trying to implement in a self-regulatory way at least the minimization principles with regard the, to retain the data as minimal as possible for the purpose of the business. In this case, for billing purpose, for traffic management, and that's all. And then they delete it. I think I would just add, I think it's something that Robert said earlier, which is um, uh, what you need to bear in mind is that what we're really asking ISPs to do and what they're doing is something that's already provided for in their terms of service and those generally prohibit the use of an account to infringe IP rights and allow the ISPs to take those types of steps. So there is, in fact, notice and, and consent from the for user for those types of, of processing. And um, in the European Union, in fact, all the data retention requirements are in large part spelled out regarding a lot of that type of data. and. Um, um, lots of times, I, I'm not familiar with your particular policy, but the companies will have policies that uh, regarding all kinds of data retention. So there are um, privacy built into these types of structures and concepts like notice and, and choice is, is there. So maybe it would be useful to ask how many people in the room have read their internet providers' terms of service. So maybe there's a problem, right? And that gets us back to what was discussed in the plenary. I don't see someone, sir. Did you want to respond, Bob? Well, I think that th this is going to be an issue that we're going to be, you know, that I think we're going to end up dealing with. Um, the, the whole data retention issue is coming. Um, we're going to end up dealing with that uh, in the United States. We already have the Obama administration through the FBI arguing for some fairly expansive data retention requirements for law enforcement. And I think that debate is coming down down the road in terms of in terms of what those rules are going to be. In the U.S., we have you know we have what appears to be a broken system in terms of copyright enforcement. I mean, the content owners, and I'm I'm not going to you know defend them on this point, but they they kind of have a Hobson's choice at this point. One is to do nothing. Um, the other is to go and do what MPAA did and, and go out and, and sue people um, and and. Neither of those things seem to, you know, don't, don't seem to be really very good choices. Um, so they just. That was R I think that's R double. Oh, R. I'm sorry, I did it. I, it's the recording industry. I, I, uh, I didn't mean to use your acronym for the recording industry. Sorry, it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's a, it's a difficult choice. I think that we we do need some improvements in the area of enforcement um, that that fall somewhere in between you know, where we're at today and, and, and where they're going. That's why we've actually participated in, in, in the programs around um, education of the customer. Um, we do call it graduated response because um, we, we ultimately, uh, in, in some of the discussions we've had, I think it's going to make sure that the customer actually gets the terms of service um, so that, that it's available for them to read. We've tried to make them much more readable than than they were. They were originally drafted by lawyers to uh, basically protect the company and are very broad and very long. We've actually shortened our policy um, significantly. I think we could still use some improvements. See, around so that that's that's the improvement. thing about proportionality that it bothers me that it bothers me that we're focused on the debate of graduated response because it, this is not about suing people right. and it's not about bringing criminal complaints and it may only be about hey will you please read this tutorial about copyright 
and it's, and it's not even saying, look, we may be wrong. Maybe you didn't infringe this, but we're sending you a notice that you may have. Uh, and so we're, we're much more focused on an issue about enforcing the rule of law on the internet. If something bad happens to me on the internet, whether it's copyright infringement, identity theft, phishing, uh, defamation, all kinds of civil wrongs that can occur to me on the internet that may or may not be actionable under criminal law or the criminal authorities are simply out chasing Osama bin Laden and have, don't have enough time, am I going to have a form of redress for this civil wrong? And if the data disappears two seconds after it's been created, then I won't be able to right that wrong and it might be, it may even be a violation of data protection rules. Uh, and so uh, that, might, that, might, that I will no longer be able to prove because the uh, German ISPs deleted the data two days after they retained it. Uh, so all we are talking about it is a proportional response. The question is we're, not, we're, we're, uh, we're on two different sides of a chasm on what is proportional. So perhaps there is a, a bit of a divide. With respect, we are at a privacy conference in the, when we got a data protection supervisor ex expressing concern and identifying issues. Well, it's, I think, the, I think an draft, issue. I think it's an issue. a draft of ACTA that was merely somebody's notes. No, I understand that. But, but the, the 20 page document, and, and the reason I raised it was not to, to fight about ACTA, but was rather to say here's a perspective coming from the privacy community about those issues. And, you know, in, in order to have the kind of dialogue that I think you suggested those data protection supervisors want to have, I suspect if we had one on the panel, they wouldn't say, sorry, I'd, like, I'd rather talk about how you ensure that your copyright gets enforced. They want, to under, they want to better understand, I think, some of those privacy implications of what you propose, what, what you, what's been proposed and put on the you table. Know, from an ISP I, 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 sorry, sorry, I was just going to tell you, from an ISP's perspective, and data retention is going to be at the center of a lot of this, nobody has any problems with what we do in order to stop spam. I mean, there's an article in the New York Times today, there's an article in the New York Times today about um, the, the, the Russian syndicate, one guy, three computers, who's responsible for about 20% of the, the spam on the internet on a daily basis, finally, you know, getting nabbed by Russian authorities. And, and we have people who want us, I, am, I know I saw him yeah, waving. <laughs> we have people who, who actively want us to make sure that that illegal activity is stopped. That's why we're going to have this debate, and we're going to have a debate about data retention, and ultimately policymakers are going to have to make the choice as to where that line is drawn. But, you know, this is just one unlawful activity of several unlawful activities that governments are concerned about here. I think the proportionality is very important, and then when there are crimes, there should be uh, prosecuted. So we are not talking that there should not be an alternative to data retention. We are talking about, for instance, data preservation, which is the actual uh, system that is working right now in the United States uh, to replace the data retention system for a target collection um, preservation model. So then you could go and prosecute your, the crime. Uh, and I'm asking, we are talking about the rule of law, but then we said that we put in, in the, they have the ISPs in their contracts uh, consent for the disclosure of information. You were mentioned something similar, something like that. And I wonder, uh, is that really consent? When we talk about consent, we are talking about informed consent freely given and fairness. And this is a rule of law, and we don't think that fulfilled in a contract. And that's my concrete example of why I critic those kind of comments. Let me, let me throw it open to the floor. We've been going on for a while. I see. I saw the first hand here, then there, here, and there. So we'll start with you, sir. Just if, do we have someone that's, that's passing around a microphone? Or? Is that working? Yeah. Um, I'm a data commissioner and a copyright lawyer, and um, so I thought I might give you my perspective. Sorry? Can you hear me? Sorry. I, why don't perhaps stand up, maybe yeah. to make it easier for someone. I'll start again. I'm Thanks. both a data commissioner and formerly a copyright lawyer, and um, I thought I might give you some of my perspectives, at least from our jurisdiction, which is Australia. And I, I did note that I've, um, as a copyright lawyer, acted for at least two of the organisations that are represented on the panel. Um, um, in Australia, the approach is that privacy law actually is a matter of public policy, um, doesn't protect illegal conduct. Um, copyright infringement is criminal, a criminal offence in Australia. It's also a civil wrong. 
Um, and so it's dealt with in two ways, um, as a matter of legislative precedence and as a matter of, um, of uh, exemptions from privacy principles. So you have a, a copyright law in Australia, you also have a privacy law. Um, and the rules of statutory interpretation are that they're to be read together in so far as they can. Um, and if there's a conflict, uh, a conflict between the two, the latest prevails. Um, I don't know that there's been any decision because I don't um, about um, precedents because I don't actually think that the precedents laws have been engaged. Um, I don't think there has been a, a conflict between the two. Um, but um, there's there's certainly no difficulty if you're engaged in illegal conduct. Um, to um, um, ameliorating or, in fact, for the laws of um, um, disclosure or use and disclosure um, to be suspended. But that doesn't mean that, um, that um, an ISP or anyone for that matter can just simply hand over um, um, details of suspected infringement to intellectual property owners. Um, just as in a paper-based society, um, there were always rules about pre-trial discovery, about bringing a prima facie case to get the information um, and then being able to prove it, and then being able to make a case um, that's a reasonable copyright case. Um, all of those rules still apply in the online environment. So, for example, if uh, the Record Industry Association of America wanted to, um, wanted to pursue an individual, um, my view as an Australian court would probably throw that out if it was just a case of a few isolated infringements because it's just not worth getting an injunction. And the damage is actually quite trivial. Um, if you take the measure of damages being the, the measure of damages of what, what you would pay for, on a, for an, iTunes, um, an iTunes purchase, it's $1.69. Um, so you really are talking about large-scale large -scale infringements. Um, so that's the way it's reconciled in Australia, and um, 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 I, I, interest, I, I listen with interest to the complexity of the arguments, but um, I still think that there's a lot that the paper-based uh, paper system still have to tell us. Um, I, I think if um, an Australian government tried to put in place a surveillance system um, that uh, permitted intellectual property owners to um, surveil um, traffic and to impose liabilities on internet, internet service providers on the basis of secondary infringement, they'd simply be tossed out of office. Is there anyone who wanted to respond? Well, and I, I agree. I mean, from an ISP's perspective, that's the, the rule of law in Australia sounds very similar to what it is in the United States. We don't provide any customer-specific data to the content owner as part of the system that we've put in place. Um, it, it is available to them that they could go to court, they could get a court order to get the name and address associated with the IP address, but that's why we don't want to be in the position, we're not in the position to judge whether or not the copyright owner has a valid claim um, of copyright infringement. And if, and, if, and if we're forced to do something uh, that's not just whatever if, if there's a lawful subpoena, then we have to comply with a lawful subpoena. But we don't want to stop and, and have to do something like terminate our customer service um, based on an allegation from a content owner. There has to be some due process, and they have, you know, they have to, something's got to happen, and then a court's got to tell us that that's the result that they want, or else, you know, we'll have that debate in a legislative context. So um, in the States, we have this thing called statutory damages. Um, which is a, a, an alternative non-market-based measure of damages that the plaintiff can elect. And as a result of that, we've had several court cases in which individuals were sued for, you know, ordinary random acts of downloading um, and resulted in verdicts in the six and seven figures. Um, so that's arguably an instance of the copyright system being broken rather than of the copyright privacy balance, and I see you nodding your head, uh, sir, um, and certainly, um, you know, that's probably a different panel, but, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't dispute that point. Um, it's not, so, so, so it's not the case um, that everywhere in the world one can comfortably rely on the discretion of the court um, to separate um, what one of my colleagues called the, um, uh, I guess, the fair use sheep from the infringing goats, um, uh, and, and that we would want to commit ourselves to the discretion of the courts uh, to do that. 
Um, there, there are some problems with, with relying on that discretion. Um, I, I just, this is kind of a segue, but I had an experience one time um, of sitting in synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, so I can tell, I'm in Yerushalayim, I can tell this story, and hearing the rabbi preach a sermon about how you should never, ever, 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 ever copy anything um, from the internet. Um, why did the rabbi preach this sermon on Rosh Hashanah, you might ask? Um, uh, and uh, the answer seemed to be that she had been given as a gift a packet from a congregation member. It's a congregation in Washington, D.C. that uh, contained a lot of uh, members of the Judiciary Committee and the, and the recording and motion picture uh, industries. Um, that was an educational packet for the clergy, um, instructing them what to tell their congregation about what is and is not okay to do. And of course, I went and wrote her a very long letter afterward and sent her some reading materials of my own. Um, but, uh, but, you know, when you say we're simply about educating people to comply with the law, um, there's a big question hanging out there unaddressed about what exactly is the law with which you are educating people to comply. Um, and, uh, and, and it often tends to be a view that lacks, shall we say, a certain amount of nuance um, and flexibility. Uh, and, and that's a problem. Um, it, you know, I, I have absolutely nothing to say in defense of people who trade movies, uh, pirate movies on peer-to-peer -peer networks. I, I think it's wrong. I think it should be punished. Um, the, the problem is that so much much more is happening. The back. Thank you. I'm Stuart Dresner, Chief Executive, Privacy Laws and Business. Now, two of the panel members have referred to recent cases. Um, Ted Shapiro referred to the Pro Musicae case uh, involving the European Court of Justice, in which its um, ruling was ambiguous, really leaving it up to member states. Um, and, um, and Michael Geist referred to the recent case in Switzerland. Um, and I just wanted to say that we have report, we continue to report these cases in our International Privacy Laws and Business Newsletter. We wrote up both cases in some detail. Even the one in Switzerland was indeed very recent, the 8th of September um, this year. Um, but our correspondent in Switzerland, who's one of the leading privacy lawyers, has written it up. I brought with me a few sample copies, and I'm happy to give them to anyone who wants. But both that, uh, not the Pro Musicae case, was some time ago, so that's in an old edition, but um, still available. But the this one here is available on uh, the, the publication stand, and then you can find a one-page report. We, we do conciseness. One-page report on the Swiss case, and also a two-page report on a recent French case um, with the opposite conclusion to the Swiss case. So uh, one su Swiss Supreme Court case saying invading individuals' privacy is wrong. The French uh, Paris Court of Appeal case saying um, individuals... Um, uh, uh, no, the other way around. Okay. And there's quite a few other... Was that a question or an advertising? No, that was, that was <laughs> the providing information and anyone could pick up newsletters if they want. At least we know the privacy community is paying attention. Um, yeah. I, think, I, I think it was you, sir. I, I see those two hands. I've got another one over there. But So we'll start here, then we'll go there, there, and then you two gentlemen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, I had two questions. One, there was a little bit of discussion about digital rights management technologies, encryption, protection of uh, uh, in-home work networks through encryption protocols, and there was some discussion about how some of those DRM technologies implicate privacy rights, and I wanted to get some information from those people who do think that they implicate privacy rights, how they implicate privacy rights, because um, I, I work a lot with those protections for Warner Brothers also, and none of them collect anybody's information. So I'm trying to figure out what the privacy implications are, for example, of encrypting content on a DVD. I can understand if someone says, well, that prevents copying and that prevents fair use copying. Fair enough, but that's not a privacy issue. So that was my first question. And my second question is that, you know, a lot of it can be common to say the content companies, right? But a lot of creators are individual creators. We have the case of the director of the movie, Along Came Lola, you know, really being very upset that she's not making money off of her first independent film and seeing it pirated all over the internet. And, you know, this is not somebody who made a movie for Disney or Warner or any other big company who actually can has the resources to engage in a certain amount of anti-piracy activity, but individual creators who create something, who hope to get some return from it, who end up not because their works, if they're popular, get very badly pirated. I wanted to ask particularly the, you know, 
Professor Cohen and the uh, Katrina from EFF, what do they think are appropriate means for those people to defend their rights? Um, so on your first question, I think, um, I think there is um, a widely held but inaccurate um, perception that privacy is simply about the flow of information. Um, and, and of course the, the terminology data protection lends itself to that kind of misperception. Um, but if you think about what is privacy from the perspective not of a data protection commissioner or a privacy officer but from the perspective of an ordinary person, privacy has other dimensions in particular spatial and, uh, and uh, relational dimensions. Um, so, you know, if you are sitting in your house, um, one thing you would like, presumably, is not to have streams of information flowing out of your house about what you are doing there, but another thing you would probably like is not to have um, the architecture of your house constrained in a particular way um, uh, because of a decision made somewhere outside your house about what kinds of conduct you are to be permitted and not permitted inside. Um, uh, perhaps, you know, the person who manufactured your sofa is worried um, that you will damage it or use it for some sort of unlawful purpose so it's to be chained to the floor in a particular spot and you're not allowed to move it around and of course um, that's ridiculous, right? Um, but that's a kind of a spatial sense of privacy that we have independent of whether any information flows. Um, I would argue, and I have argued in my writing, that we have that kind of a spatial sense of privacy in some of the, acti the cultural and expressive and intellectual activities that we undertake. It's not entirely about the streams of inf information. Um, there are ways in which particular implementations of DRM or trusted systems intrude to such a degree on our expectations of mobility um, that they create a privacy problem um, that's not about information flow at all. Um, as to your second question, um, what should the independent producer do to protect um, his or her rights? Um, I'm sympathetic to the problem, and I also would not say there would be no implementation of digital rights management that is to be permitted. Um, uh, the devil is so much in the details and so much in the qualitative nature of the constraint. Um, uh, I, it's, it's certainly true that any independent artist trying to break into um, greater prominence in one of the cultural industries has a variety of entry barriers to overcome, um, uh, and perhaps piracy is not even the greatest of them. Um, uh, getting noticed, getting a market share, getting a distributor, getting a market share if you're not going to have a distributor. Um, we can just put piracy on that list. There are structural barriers to entry within those industries for independent creators. Um, and um, if we are to make the industries more hospitable for those people, sure, piracy could be a piece of that conversation, but it's not the only piece by any stretch. Um, I was referring for the network level filtering, that's uh, also a measure, not the cities, of, uh, of course. Uh, although she has addressed the DRM issue, I was more talking about the online um, digital life, <laughs> and the network level filtering, which will require the packet inspection with as massive surveillance of technology. Um, John, that's the only question. I think it was this gentleman up here first. Sorry, the, the mic up just up front, first row. Oh, okay. I think my question was stolen by my colleague from Warner Brothers, and that was the question of what, uh, in, the, in the view of the privacy advocates, what means would, that are effective would be permitted under an appropriate balance of data protection and intellectual property rights. But I, I did hear the question. I didn't really hear an answer to it other than a sort of litany of barriers to entry, one of which is, is piracy. I, I did hear Professor Cohen say earlier that breathing room for intellectual play is essential for a, dy a dynamic intellectual culture. And I would ask, what form of intellectual culture can survive without effective enforcement of intellectual property rights? And again, what, what means would be permissible to protect intellectual property rights in the digital environment, if any? So 
No, the form of intellectual culture that could survive is the form that we've had for 2,000 odd years. Um, it's, a, it's a great mistake that copyright lawyers don't spend more time learning art history uh, and musicology uh, and film history. Um, you can go into any sub area of creative activity that you name and look for borrowings um, and look for copyings and appropriations and reworkings and that's the lion's share of what it is. You can trace tropes through the history of music from folk tunes to classical music to pop tunes and back again. You can do it in film, you can do it in literature. Um, uh, we have had and we always will have because that is the way creative activity works, a creative culture that is centrally dependent on borrowing and reworking. In the last sort of century and a half superimposed upon that dynamic has been a system of economic protection for culture industries. And I have said in my writing, and will continue to say it, I think those industries are really important. Um, it anchors the system, right? If you have a Star Wars at the center with which my own child is currently obsessed, you have all the people borrowing and taking uh, elements from uh, that particular fantasy universe and creating things of their own. So it's not the case that these economic protections are unimportant, but it is very much not the case that if we ratcheted back just a tiny little bit in the name of other fundamental values that we also hold dear, that the culture industries would crash to the ground. They're quite robust. So. Are you looking to respond? Uh, I mean, the notion that each, one, each new iteration, each new expression of one of these, um, of these old works that have fallen into the public domain uh, don't need protection is worrying and what incentivizes is people to take up the old and express it in a new way is intellectual property protection um, and so we still haven't heard really uh, we, we always hear whatever you're doing is now coming into the spatial continuum time space warp that uh, that privacy now <laughs> covers everything and, yet, and the, only, the only solution that I, that I hear is, well, we'll slap a compulsory license on the internet, and that will help to incentivize uh, uh, creation in, in this new space. And, and I don't think that that is the case, that in fact it will do quite the opposite. But there we go. Um, I want to make a, a short comment, um, answering a little his question. We are... We believe that uh, when there is a crime or there's someone uh, doing some, some illegal activity or some criminal, that should be sh sanctioned. What we are arguing here is the excessive techniques they are using for prosecuting those crimes. And for instance, I was very surprised to hear that they are very interested in data re retention a provision. And for us, this is completely excessive. It requires the collections of all IP address, even those who are not suspicious suspicions of any crime and, and save it for a certain period of time. And this creates a lot of unintended consequences. And this is the kind of things that we are uh, discussing. The massive monitoring of all the, the, uh, of all the citizens, not only those who are targeted. So we are arguing not to not have any tools. You could have the target collection um, through a data preservation model that could fulfill your, your, your your objective, and that is proportionality. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, my name is Ian Kerr. I hold the Canada Research Chair in Ethics, Law, and Technology at the University of Ottawa. Um, I just identified myself, and I just named myself. Um, those happen to coincide, but they are not the same thing. I can be identified without naming myself. Um, I think if we start with that distinction, it's, in my view, indisputable um, that what's going on in copyright enforcement involves identifiability, at the very least. If that's correct, um, I now want to sort of turn to the concept of surveillance. I think the accepted understanding of what surveillance is within the surveillance study literature is any systematic attempt to identify an individual with the intent of um, affecting their behavior. I think if you also accept what is the accepted definition within the surveillance studies literature, I think it's also indisputable that uh, copyright enforcement necessarily entails uh, surveillance. It is a necessary precondition of surveillance. Uh, 
the only alternative that I can think of uh, to that system would be some system of preemption, which presumably is what some technological solutions would try to achieve. So if I'm right about that, then I think that we have to get past this idea that you can't talk about IP as being in conflict uh, with uh, data protection. Um, whether the word versus equals a zero-sum zero gain, uh, I, I think that's not the issue that's at play here. I think what's going on here is that if the aim of any entity is to engage in copyright enforcement, what they are doing is systematically identifying individuals even if they can't name them. So that's the first point and I'd be interested to know if anybody has a response to that, if I've missed some point in my attempt at syllogistic reasoning to, <laughs> to, to make the claim that I'm making there. I want to make one more claim um, uh, and that is uh, about, well, actually I want to make a distinction. The distinction is between copyright enforcement and alleged copyright enforcement. Um, while I am also sympathetic and fully heartedly agree that illegal conduct um, um, uh, is not something which should always garner um, some kind of shield of privacy, there has to be a distinction that's clearly kept in mind in this case, especially insofar as this kind of copyright enforcement is usually done in the private sector. Um, that that there is an al the difference between an allegation um, and an actual illegal act. And so my ter yours or my terms of service agreement uh, can certainly stipulate certain things about a justification for identifying an individual when and there's an allegation that the cow jumps over the moon. Um, but that's very different uh, from um, having the kinds of grounds that one would have to achieve to go to court. So it's not quite as simple as that. So um, I make these two points because I really want to see this argument actually go somewhere. Um, and so I would like to know if, if I'm missing something there so that we can actually connect these two topics of privacy and copyright enforcement um, or if at least we're on the same page uh, with respect to that because it's not clear to me from the way the panel discussion has gone. I'm happy for any of the panelists to speak to that. You know, in my other job, I've had to deal with net neutrality for the last four years. And my experience in that debate has been, and I've been on the other side, I've been in the shoes, if you will, of the content owners today, um, which is net neutrality is almost like the Goldilocks test, right? What, what you propose isn't good enough, but I don't have an answer for you. And you're not going to get an answer until you actually, I think, get policy makers to sit down and come up with concrete solutions to have the debate around. Because you can't have the debate just around the arguments. Because in, in the end, Professor Cohen is right about a lot of you know, the things that she's saying. And in the end, these guys are right. But until you have concrete solutions in front of you, you're not going to solve the problem. That's why they call them intermediaries. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but so it is about Goldilocks, right? But so here's an example, right? Um, best practices for automated filtering of user-generated content. Um, you may recall, um, or, or you may not know about it, but there have been a series of efforts to try and design such best practices. There was one that was led by a coalition, um, I think principally of content uh, folks with some intermediaries. And then there was a counter effort, um, principally from the NGO sector. And they were really different. Um, and and it's, then there seemed to be kind of a stalemate, um, but, but my sense is that um, the, the, you know, if I could get a free pass to go poke inside the automated filtering that's being done on YouTube, that it looks a lot more like the first of those proposals than the second. I could be wrong. Um, the, you know, there is this room in the middle to experiment with solutions, and what we have done really badly, excuse me, um, is, is um, we have very done a very bad job at using law to structure the incentives um, so that they create not simply an incentive to filter to avoid your own liability, but an incentive to design your filtering in a way that preserves um, uh, to the greatest extent feasible enough breathing room for ordinary people to do the kinds of things they need to do. That may be, I'm not a techie, right? So to some extent that may be a fantasy. Um, it's hard, um, but I don't think it is completely 
you know, out of the question, and you're sitting there saying it isn't. Um, so, um, but the law doesn't do that, at least the U.S. laws don't do that. If the U.S. law said, oh, and by the way, there's also going to be a risk of liability if you don't design uh, systems that are forgiving enough. I know you're going to hate this because then you're getting it from, from both sides. Um, but but the, some of the incentives need to start pushing back the other way. Um, so that's one example of a kind of a solution strategy. It's, it's ironic because the, the, we see the incentives um, for ISPs going the exact opposite way. In the DMCA provisions, the, the, the so-called safe harbors, I call them the privileges, the ISP privileges, the same ones that are found in Articles 12 to 15 of the e-commerce directive, um, were meant, if you read the recitals of the directive, to encourage cooperation between rights holders. In actual fact, they had the opposite effect. Um, but it's always where you're looking at it, especially what your, what your point was. Um, but come to your question, uh, we don't engage in systematic monitoring of the internet. Um, we do go onto certain networks, BitTorrent networks. We do targeted uh, surveillance. Uh, different national content protection organizations have clearances from national DPAs to engage in different activities. But systematic n monitoring of the entire internet no, complete. I, I didn't say systemic. I said systematic. Oh, well, I guess I, I guess I took it from your definition that that's what you meant so to come back to your syllogism. Targeted, yeah. I mean, I think ah. Still the same. ah, okay. Well, just to clarify, and then with respect, and then we would also uh, uh, assert that our evidence gathering methods are highly robust and have stood uh, before courts all over the world. Yes, other industries have made mistakes with respect to their evidence, but ours we consider to be very, very robust. But coming back to the beginning of what you were saying and the beginning of what I was saying, most of our enforcement efforts are focused on large-scale infringing sites. And because we do believe that that has a big impact on the piracy that we're dealing with on the internet, the, the solution to all of this is actually just more legal content, something that Alyssa was saying at the beginning. More illegal, more legal offerings on the internet the way that consumers want them. And are we all the way there? No. Of course, competing against what's out there makes that more difficult and we have to guarantee a quality of service. Um, but the, every new service that launches on the internet is actually a step forward. We're always going to engage in a certain level of enforcement. We're not going to get rid of all of this piracy. We didn't get rid of it all on the analog world. We'd like to keep it down to a normal level. We'd like to educate consumers and go after, criminally or civilly, guys that are making a lot of money off of it. And that will always be our focus. Okay, we're, we're close to running out of time. Uh, the gentleman right there, if you raise your hand, and then one more in the front row, and that'll be that. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Scott Matthews from the U.S. Department of Commerce, but uh, obviously I'm speaking on my own behalf. Um, the more questions that have been raised, the more questions or comments I've been thinking of, so I'll, I'll try and be succinct. But I guess one of the earlier comments I was thinking of was that uh, on pirated products, the malware that is in them, I think we have ample evidence that, uh, that pirated or counterfeit products are generally laden with malware or malicious code. Um, there have been enough studies done to, to reflect that. And I think the same can be said of, uh, of any of the other media as well, that pirated copies generally come with something you don't want. Uh, in addition, of course, there's always the issue that they are generally not of the quality that the person thinks they're getting. So there's that aspect too. In terms of the intellectual uh, culture as it's developed, and perhaps I misunderstood, Professor, but I guess I was thinking that in the past, we've had, we've always had problems or legal issues when it comes to forgery or counterfeit products. And I think that's been the case for hundreds of years. So if I would look at what, we, what you were discussing as more fair use, someone taking somebody's ideas, someone's paintings, and using that to develop their own versus the wholesale copying and distribution. So I think that a slight distinction, perhaps. Um, my, my original comments, anyway, on the what is called three strikes and you're out. And my thought there was that as the internet is becoming so, such a necessary part of life, 
uh, particularly for e-government, for the distribution of uh, public services. In a proportionate response, I would think it would be very difficult to get to the, that point where you could take somebody off the internet without it having an effect that is not proportionate. So I, I think that there's, there are stages along the way, perhaps, that are proportionate, but when you get to that extreme, the effect, I think, is probably no longer, that's no longer the case. Uh, and the last comment, um, I think it's somewhat unfortunate at these conferences that generally the people we have at the table are the good people, the good companies, people that are trying to do the right thing, may have differences of opinion. I mean, this panel, I think, would be more powerful in a sense if you had the CEO of Alibaba, you know, the Chinese search engine company, which is notorious for all of the piracy that takes place. And I think one of the things that we need to think about, and this is not the, the data privacy issue, it's no, those notorious offenders, those individuals or companies or intermediaries that are illegally downloading, illegally distributing in the thousands copies of, you know, of, of goods, and the laws, particularly in China, but elsewhere, are not effective. And bringing a lawsuit, as we've seen in China, has not been effective either. So I, I, perhaps that's a distinction that needs to be made, and I just leave that open to anybody who'd like to comment on my thoughts. Okay, you know, given the time, I'm actually going to ask this gentleman up at the front who I think, did you still want to raise a question or comment? If you, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll keep people from their coffee for two minutes. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm that's sorry. the advantage of being chair and moderator. Sorry, maybe that my English is not good, uh, good enough that I can understand everything uh, you talk today. My name is uh, Carsten Neumann. I'm a data protection commissioner in Germany. And therefore, I will make it short uh, and a little bit harder. Uh, do you have no other idea than uh, to, to change the data protection law? No. I heard no other idea, and, uh, and therefore I would say, like, like Mark Zuckerberg, forget copyright and internet. But just to be clear, we, we've not called for, uh, I haven't called in this discussion, I have not called for a change in the data protection uh, laws. I've not called for a change in the framework directive. I think that the framework directive, as I said at the outside of my remarks, is a very balanced piece of legislation that holds the answers to these questions. What we do see are very strict interpretations in some member states. Uh, the gentleman before, and I mentioned it at the beginning, there are differing interpretations by the courts in different countries, but I have not called for a change in the data protection rules in Europe. Um, I think that it's quite important that right now the data protection commissioners, and it's just more um, uh, final statement, uh, get engaged in this discussion. I think that some of the practices are really infringing the national data protection legislation, and there is a need to make an enforcement of the law. The enforcement is being a problem in privacy, not only in this area, but in general. So I'm calling you, please, we need more cases. We need cases in Germany, maybe not in Ireland, <laughs> you know? And so we need those laws that be enforced. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that's... That's a good way okay, to end it in the sense that we, we, we did actually hear from a couple of data protection and privacy commissioners. Uh, and clearly, you know, we, we, a lot of issues on the table, but still much to be discussed down the road. So I hope you'll join, join me in thanking all of our panelists.